is Renee DeResta, and she is the technical research manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory at Stanford University. And she investigates the spread of malign narratives across social and other media networks. Her areas of research include disinformation and propaganda by state-sponsored actors, health and disinformation and misinformation, conspiracy theories, and she's advised the U.S. Congress, the State Department, academia, and civic and business organizations. And we have Gordon Pennycook, who is assistant professor of the University of Regina at Hill Levine Schools of Business in Canada. His work on mis and disinformation is timely and relevant. Uh, those of you who have followed it realize he did coin the term bullshit receptivity, one that I just adore. And it's um, uh, really a great pleasure to have both of you, Renee and Gordon. Gordon, I'd like you to kick off. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. So I have slides because I can't say no to any opportunity to have slides. Uh, I want to just make two quick points, basically. Um, and they relate to what I, I often see as kind of false claims relating to fake news, or at least what I think to be false based on our own data. And the first one is that when, when you see that someone shares something that's false, the assumption is often that it's done on purpose to some extent. Okay. We, we did some studies on this, and I'll give you some examples of one study we did. We give people actual true and false news headlines in a survey experiment. And there's a few things we can learn from this. The first thing is what we found is that, first of all, I should say, most people don't share fake news. But in the cases when a fake news headline is shared, only a third of the time we can attribute it to people being confused. That is, they thought that it was true, even though it's false, and they shared it. Okay, so but a third of the time people were confused when they were sharing fake news. Half of the time, 51% of the time, people were sharing things that were false because they didn't even consider whether it was true or false. They weren't paying attention to accuracy. And then what you have left over are those cases where someone says, I think that this fake thing is actually false and I wanna share it anyway. So those are the real jerks that are trolling people. But that's a minority position. Most of the sharing is people sharing things because they don't even think about whether it's true. And this relates to the second point I wanna make about the role that social media plays in all of this, which I think is complicated and I'm going to oversimplify things because I have two minutes to talk about this, but I will get into it more in the panel. So what we did here is we ran an experiment on Twitter where we created bots uh, and we followed people on Twitter with the bots and sent them a message about accuracy. Now, we don't care if they res nobody responded to the message. We don't even care that they read the whole message. We just want to get the idea of accuracy in their heads. What this does is that it, makes it more likely for them to think about whether things are true when they're sharing. And the outcome is that you have higher quality news content being shared. That is a single DM reminding people about accuracy improves the quality of the content that people share. Um, and that quality based on fact check, fact check or trustworthiness ratings. And so what this indicates is that, well, there's two things, right? I already started by saying people share things often because they don't even think about whether they're true. And what this means is that Facebook is probably not melting our brains, right? It might be distracting us from thinking about accuracy, but it's not making us incapable of recognizing what's true and false, right? Uh, and part of that is not a Facebook problem. It's a us problem that we're not thinking about things sufficiently. We're not considering whether they're true before we're sharing. We're thinking about whether people are going to like it or how does it make us look and so on. And so that's part of that. We have to take ourselves um, more seriously and we have to think about accuracy before we share things. And that's my spiel. I'm looking forward to the panel. So now from the other half of the panel, Renee, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'm at Stanford Internet Observatory and we study pathological information systems. Um, I, I think one of the things that really resonated with me about Gordon's presentation just there is the focus on agency. And I think that that is a very important focus and uh, under discussed in the conversations about mis and disinformation. We don't do survey experiments uh, at SIO. So we are not really looking so much at that agency component, at that, that kind of human, um, human actor component. We look at two other A's, if you will, uh, the algorithms and the affordances. So a lot of the time when we talk about these conversations, when we think about the framing, we frame it as algorithms, affordances, and then agency. Um, algorithms get a lot of play in the press. They are things that 
uh, that curate our feeds, for example, that rank our uh, rating that sort of rank our results for us that uh, recommend content to us. So the kind of way in which information is organized algorithmically and then transmitted to the user. So we'll look occasionally at unintended consequences of algorithms. Um, then there's the affordances piece, which again, this intersects with agency in that people are actually using these features, right? So a person now actively participates in the sharing process, actively transmits. You know, I heard Dr. Christakis and Dr. Santola, their presentations earlier, that idea of contagion, that idea of spread. We're very interested in that as well. We have a, a research project right now called the Virality Project, the double entendre being we're studying vaccine hesitancy and, uh, you know, and the propaganda and misinformation about COVID-19, uh, the transmission of, uh, of information and the transmission of disease following these pathways that both of them articulated. So when we talk about affordances, we're interested in the dynamic of what platforms give to people and what they do with that. And so there's that, um, that recognition that for any mis or disinformation campaign, someone somewhere is attempting to exert influence and service to spreading a message or obtaining some degree of power. And the dynamics there, the dynamics of that use of the infrastructure, we see very, very common patterns regardless of what the content is, whether it's COVID or whether it's the election. And so it's not that Facebook is melting our brains, it's that Facebook has given us and all of the other platforms have given us a new set of affordances, a new set of tools and how we use them uh, and then the way that that usage intersects with algorithms um, really does uh, have a determining effect on the way in which things spread. So we spend a little bit more time looking at the mechanism of the process by which things spread and then policy recommendations, sometimes for the platforms, sometimes for regulators, but related to how might we um, mitigate unintended consequences or the worst effects. So bringing you both together here, um, let's walk through the who aspect of this. Should we actually be working at understanding individuals or individuals in groups or groups at scale about the who? Who is more likely to believe uh, fake news or disinformation or misinformation? And the way we differentiate usually, I think we all agree, is misinformation is not necessarily intentional. Disinformation is an intentional act. Um, and so is there, are, are there those, um, you know, who are, who are more susceptible to this, Gordon? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I obviously think that we should look, look at that, but, <laughs> but I'm a psychologist, so. I mean, that's, uh, I have to say well, that. Well, talk to us about I that. Would, who, who, how would you, how would, would you describe them and how would, how would you describe them and how would we test for that? So there's like, so part of what I said was that people aren't kind of paying attention to accuracy. There's, is a more fundamental issue there, which is that people aren't paying attention or they're not thinking, right? When we, when you go on Facebook or whatever, often it's to shut your brain off, right? Like you're taking a break from work. It's, it's not intended to be like a thinking activity. You scroll quickly, uh, the things are all there. They're being ordered in a way that would make, that will maximize your engagement. And so like everything's pointing in the direction of not thinking about things. And so some people do, regardless of those other underlying elements, spend more time thinking. They're, some people are more intuitive. They go with their gut feelings. Some people tend to be more reflective. And those people also tend to be less receptive to bullshit and all the other things. And so that's, that's a kind of key element. And that intersects with how we, uh, we deal with the algorithms that we, you know, we engage with on social media. So, so when we test, for example, when we test at scale, we test for need for affect, high or low, and need for cognition, high or low. And what you seem to be saying is people who test very low in need for cognition may be more susceptible. They are, although need for cognition is not a great measure, but because it's not exactly a need. What would you... It's more like a, well, yeah, what would like you a, a disposition to think analytically, yeah. And what would you measure instead of using that? Well, they, well, actually, I have a paper on this with my grad student. We have a new comprehensive thinking style measure, if you're interested in it. But it, it, there's there's different there elements are. to what it means to be an analytic thinker. So, like, if one element is being have an actively open-minded uh, stance towards evidence, so it's not just that you like thinking, but you question your beliefs. You you uh, want to make sure that what you believe is accurate. That's a really important element of thinking style. You know, enjoying thinking. That's also something that's going to be important. That's kind of what need for cognition is whether you have a kind of faith in your in intuitive guesses, that's another one, and whether you're kind of closed-minded or dogmatic. You know, if it's if it's hard for you to think about things that you don't want to think that are like contrary to what your ideology says or whatever, 
that's also going to be an important element. And these are all just different dimensions of what it means to be a good thinker. Right. And sounds like, for example, would that openness be tied to the openness in, in say, uh, ocean big five personality trait tests? Somebody who is very low yeah, in openness I, and also, yeah. yeah it's, it's similar, but it's more openness to being wrong. It's, it's more related to like intellectual humility. Right. Uh, ah, and so, okay. Yeah. And, and, the, and the capacity to question your own intuitions and so on. And, um, you know, are, are, are you uh, including the Dunning-Kruger crowd, the people who are just too stupid to know they're stupid, uh, as, as sort of the heavy gravity of susceptibles? Well, if you think of it, and yes, and that is actually true, we have evidence for that. And there's another paper that was published that shows that overconfidence plays a role in people believing uh, false content. But, it, but it's the same underlying problem, right? Uh, if, you, if you're highly confident, you lack, uh, what that does is that makes it so you don't recognize that you have to think about something. One element is that people Renee, differ walking around that they need, they, some people will think about things more often than others. Being overconfident is one of the elements of that. And you find very strong evidence that people who are conspiratorial are highly overconfident, like exceptionally overconfident. Renee, in your work, um, do you find that people who maybe under a different context or circumstance may be a bit more skeptical or critical thinking, but under the pressure of a need for identity and an identity narrative, perhaps even an adversarial one, that they're willing to, to suspend that critical thinking in order to belong to that uh, identity and thus embrace the narrative? There's a lot of factional behavior in the kinds of things that we look at. So understanding how people feel compelled to become active sharers, um, oftentimes with just misinformation, there's a real altruistic motivation there. People want to inform their communities. And more than that, they also want to be seen as a person who perpetuates information, as a person who is a conduit. We see this dynamic quite a lot. One of the areas in which it was pretty remarkable was uh, in the election, uh, on the morning of election day, um, watching on Parler as parlor influencers are sort of a distinct collection of people who are have large followings on parlor and almost no followings on other social platforms but they were serving as information conduits so somebody was telling them hey here's a photograph of a man moving some uh, equipment at a voting place and you know uh, is he taking ballots big if true you know and that's the kind of dynamic that you see on Twitter and on Facebook then they move it over to parlor so this person is the conduit who's just gone to the parlor audience the people who want to engage with that content on parlor and she has now made her herself the informer, the, the, you know, the person introducing a new fact into the community for discussion. And then there's really a process of collective sense making that happens around it. People try to figure out what's going on. Now, they, you know, per some of what Gordon's described, they don't always necessarily start with like what we might consider like Occam's razor, you know, <laughs> they sort of immediately right, delve right down into um, obviously they're stealing ballots, you know. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that happens, though, is because there is this priming that happens in these groups where this, this uh, alignment, this idea that there's going to be massive fraud, something is going to be taken from them, is reinforced over and over and over again. There's that repetition um, that they see within their groups. There was a video that went viral in the start of the pandemic called Plandemic. And one of the things that we noticed, and we don't do studies of individuals um, in any material way. So we're not doing the same kind of research that uh, that Gordon is doing. We were looking at what communities that video traversed into, meaning those URLs and mentions of that content, what communities did they uh, did that content wind up in? So it started in an anti-vaccine echo chamber. It made its way into a kind of holistic health echo chamber. Again, the base audience, there's nothing remarkable about seeing anti-vaccine misinformation in anti-vaccine communities. That is exactly where you expect to find it. But in this case, it broke out. And so we looked at how it traversed. And so it made its way into QAnon. From QAnon, there was a certain degree of, uh, you know, the network dynamics that Dr. Santola was talking about earlier. Uh, there's this um, overlap. There's an audience overlap there that transmits it into uh, mainstream MAGA, you know, just pro-Trump supporting groups that have nothing to do with QAnon. From there, you have people who are just ordinary Trump supporters who then posted into their local, you know, dog group, like they're, it was in a Corgi club group, you know, and then it's discussed in the Corgi club. So now you have anti-vaccine content that made its way into the dog fanciers group. And the thing that, that we look at with that, we do look at the comments on the posts. Um, there's not really very much of a way to do that at scale programmatically because of Facebook. And we only engage in public groups with, with public comments and public data at Stanford Internet Observatory. But you see, again, that process of sense making. People are in there trying to figure out 
what has happened and if they should trust this. And you'll see people say like, hey, I see this video, but I also saw this debunking link. How should I reconcile these two things? You know, this article says that this video is nonsense. And then you see other members of the group immediately come in. Oh, well, the debunkers are bought. They're paid for. They're, you know, funded by big pharma, et cetera, et cetera. And so that dynamic of um, what are the, you know, what are the norms within the communities that you're participating in? How do people think about this information and their responsibility for sharing it? They see themselves as warriors for truth. And it's really important to understand that that is a, a really big motivation, even among misinformation where there's that accidental, if you will, spread, as opposed to the kind of coordinated, deliberate um, dissemination that we see through a, a proper disinformation campaign. And do you see any similarities, Renee, uh, when we think back about all of the parsing and analyzing of say ISIS recruitment um, any similar tactics by those who are not on the receiving end, but on the uh, disinformation side, which would be different than somebody who is, you know, just a, a hapless believer of something, but, but the actual intent. Do you see similarities between that and what has been parsed and analyzed and maybe what is going on now with something like QAnon? Yeah, so it's a, a marketing campaign for an idea, if you will. I mean, ISIS propaganda was a marketing campaign for ISIS. It was a recruitment drive for ISIS. And so they used projections of strength and power. They built a brand identity, right? The black flag, the iconography, that's what ISIS was. And ISIS did it using the same kinds of tactics and techniques that you would see from any marketing organization building a brand. The, you know, the, the influencers, um, we talk about them in the context of marketing. We also see them playing a huge role in the serving as as um, major amplifiers in mis- and disinformation campaigns, sometimes deliberately, sometimes not so deliberately, um, but that this is an infrastructure for influence and there's a sort of finite set of um, tactics that you can execute given the affordances that you have and the way that the algorithms might pick up and amplify you. And so the playbook, if you will, is really much more around how do you use these affordances in a particular way to attract attention to your cause. And we're in an age now where this is not, you know, ISIS was sort of an early adopter. Um, Russia used, you know, again, that they did it very subversively, but now there are plenty of organizations, plenty of groups, factions that want to achieve a degree of attention and notoriety for their cause. And so they are using the same affordances in the same way. And, and, that, and that's one of the real challenges actually, which is um, when you're using tools as they're designed to be used, uh, there are some real questions then around what would regulation or what would a design change look like that would uh, minimize the bad while not taking the tools out of the, you know, the, the hands of people who are not using them for manipulative purposes. And that is a really, that is a really hard question. And that was where even in 2015, you may recall the conversations about ISIS. Um, even then there were these questions about, well, what should we do about it really? Um, you know, there, there was a clear desire to take down the worst of it, the, the violence and the, you know, the, um, the sort of, uh, notorious videos that they would post. But there was also a, a real question if you read the press coverage early on around, well, if you take down ISIS, you know, where does that slippery slope lead? And, uh, and, and that, right. that has been now um, one of the questions that continues to, to shape the conversation. And, and we'll come right back to that on the systematic approach, perhaps with platforms or regulation or self-policing or outside regulation. But Gordon, um, what do we bring us up to date on where we are on changing minds. I mean, we started with, you know, the uh, Nyhan and Reifler work on the backfire effect, meaning that by repeating the myth in, in an effort to debunk it, you actually made it worse. And then, then they stepped back from that. And subsequent, you know, studies said, well, we don't see much of a backfire effect. And then you have pre-bunking, you know, can I inoculate you by telling you that, hey, there's a lot of disinformation out there. And when you hear this, mm, you better double check it. A kind of, you know, inoculation or pre-bunking. Uh, and then there's the truth sandwich coming out of RAND, which was, I'm going to give you the, the, you know, the, the warning, and then I'm going to give you the truth, and then I'm going to remind you with a warning. Where are we in terms of tactics that work? So um, the backfire effect is not really that big of a concern. 
first thing that doesn't happen that often. Um, the basic finding across all those different things you talked about is that when you give people good information, it helps generally. The, the problem with that is that doesn't fix everything. It only helps a little bit for some people some of the time, and a lot of the time it doesn't help and whatever. Um, I, think, I think where we are is that we can't do one thing. We have to do all the things. <laughs> we, have to, we have to keep in mind all the underlying elements there. People don't have uh, perfect access to information. There's lots of misinformation out there that they believe. Even if they weren't engaging with it purposefully, they have falsehoods in their brain. Uh, that we have to deal with. We need long-term education that deals with that sort of thing. People need to have good <clears throat> media literacy. They have to know how to just like look up fact checks and know what is a good source and what's a bad source. And um, and we need to keep in mind that <clears throat> even if we do have good information, people often aren't thinking that much about what they see on so on social media. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, we need like a like a Swiss cheese approach. The same thing as as during the pandemic. You know, you have to wear the masks. You keep the distancing, get vaccinated. We need all of these things all to work. And eventually, if you put everything together, and by Swiss you'll cheese, have just, just to make clear, Gordon, just to make clear what you mean about Swiss cheese effect, I think what you're saying is if you line up the slices of cheese, the holes are in different places. And so you need a variety of barriers. Is that right? Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if we think about for a second uh, uh, on the certification or the attempts to say this is, you know, flagged on social media, um, that's not really going to work, is it? Because if if you give my guy four Pinocchios, I'm just going to think you're in the pocket of the mainstream media. And so how can we ever again look at an independent kind of referee grading the quality of content and ask expect it to work well it depends what you mean by work like it would have an impact it just wouldn't work for everybody all the time and it wouldn't be that strong of an impact um and i mean the, there's prag pragmatic issues part of that too where you have to if you fact check the fact checking approach assumes that you can keep up with the falsehood which is never going to be possible right um so um and then the other element of course like what renee was talking about is often these falsehoods are embedded deeply in like uh, particular subcultures that you have to break into. And so there's no so easy solution there. You know, I mean, we uh, part of it is like just uh, a fight over how much good quality stuff information is out there. Because a lot of people, but, and one thing that we find consistently in our work is that people do care about the truth. Even people who are deeply conspiratorial care about the truth. They just, you know, com they, they've lost, they've lost the seed. They don't know where they are anymore. Um, and there's pos there's ways to get them out, but it's not going to be easy. And have you seen some of the studies of sort of cash incentives for people to arrive at a truth, uh, actually making them be more mindful about what they're reading, that regardless of what their, their identity and narrative uh, related to that identity is, when you incentivize them to come to a truth, that they're a bit more cautious and narrative, uh, I mean, I mean uh, cautious and analytical about that? Yeah, I mean, so there's kind of two elements, right? One element is you, you have to keep in mind that you have to be vigilant about what is true. And people often don't do that because they're, they have other things going on in their life. It's not the most important thing for them to know that this one thing is true. Um, and so that would help for that. The other thing, of course, is that they have to be able to figure out what is true and false based on their knowledge of the world and their capacity to look things up and whatever. And so like we, you can, you can direct some things towards making sure that people are paying attention and, and putting in effort. And that's kind of what the actress thing that I talked about was. But you also need like actual long-term educational approaches that teach people how to deal with information in the first place. Um, and so those, we're probably talking things. about an intergener. Yeah. We're probably talking about a multi-generational solution here because if you're talking about you know media yeah. literacy and critical thinking and scientific method, you're going to start with kids, and then you're going to have a politicization of that of well, you're trying to indoctrinate my kid. Um, and it's probably going to take generations, I would imagine, to get there. Let me shift gears for a second to a sort of bigger approach. And I, I jobbed out this question to Sinan Aral, who you guys know um, from uh, MIT and author of The Hype Machine. And he spoke here at Nudge Talk last year coming off of the MIT study on the propagation of false news. And the question he has for you two is this. He said, quote, solutions are only as good as they scale. I've heard lots of yep. good ideas about solutions to spread of falsity, but scaling them is one of the most important challenges to making them succeed. It seems to me that there is no silver bullet, that no one solution will work on its own, 
and that we need a system of complementary approaches working together if we hope to scale fake news solutions. If you could wave a magic wand and build this system to stop the spread of falsehoods, what would be the elements of the system and how would they work together to scale solutions to stop this? Renee? Yeah, so we've written a little bit about this in the context of our um, election work, just recommendations for, again, very narrowly tailored voting specific mis and disinformation narratives that we tracked and, and saw spread and then uh, felt that there was a you know role for government, for media, for tech platforms, there's so many different stakeholders in the process. Um, first, there's the question of of what are you proactively pushing to people, right? So this is where we get at questions of um, thinking about uh, the three main levers, policy, education, and design, right? And so if you have policy, education, and design, uh, what what government, you know, what, what should government do with those three levers? What should tech platforms do with those three levers, et cetera? So if we look at that framework, I would say the thing that, that I have observed um, is that there is a an interesting dynamic happening where consensus, that process of coming to consensus happens in these online communities, right? And it happens in full view of the public, right? So interestingly, experts also have to arrive at consensus. We, this has been very, very clear to us during the pandemic, particularly because information, you know, we, we didn't know how it was transmitted. We didn't know where it was. We didn't know whether, you know, uh, whether we should be worried about fomites or airborne or whether masks worked. And you know, there was this evolutionary uh, process in our understanding of COVID-19. But that that desire for information, for, particularly among the public, was confronted by a couple of realities. One, institutions weren't communicating particularly transparently or readily or frequently, um, which left voids for you know for for bad information to kind of come in. Uh, then there were media properties that were expressing uh, with a far higher degree of certainty things that really weren't particularly well known, which meant that when they were wrong about certain of those things and had to walk them back, that provided an opportunity for people who say you shouldn't trust media to point to very specific things, screenshot collages of headlines, for example, saying, look, they were wrong about all of these things. So there's this interesting dynamic that we have to contend with, which is how do you uh, in this very, you know, the, the sort of new normal of consensus happening in full view of the public with the public actively participating, what are the policies, uh, education and design that help us understand this particular mode of living in the world? And one of the things that I keep coming back to actually is Wikipedia, which, you know, I'm uh, of a generation where when I was in college and Wikipedia had just begun, I was told this is not a source, you know, this is, uh, this is just like randos on the internet, you know, putting stuff on a page and this is not reliable information and you need to go to the authoritative facts. Um, so you had to kind of click through and find the URL. And um, again, this is like the late 90s. But what happens today, I think, is you have this distributed consensus building happening on Wikipedia in a very trackable way. You can see what changed. You can see how it evolves, when it evolves. It's quite transparent. There's a, a beautiful version history there, like a, a version control of the process of consensus and thought. And I find that so compelling. And, and I wonder how we can replicate that a little bit more broadly in other areas. I wonder about media, for example, just doing that with their articles, just moving to this more easily, you know, instead of an editor's note after the fact, just a, a more like living style of information and consensus building uh, in these moments and, and you know tech platforms instead of pointing to a static fact check with four Pinocchios maybe pointing to uh, an area where certain of groups of experts are participating in this process and, and putting that content out publicly and acknowledging that uh, that building of facts and that discovery process because the old way of that happening in private and it being communicated to a trusting public is over and so how do we adapt to uh, this new environment? Gordon, if you, in 30 seconds, were to put together the essential elements to Sinan's questionnaire, what would they be? So uh, everything that Renee said, but also, by the way, which is related to that, if you, uh, you could crowdsource fact-checking. If you ask people to kind of guess whether things are accurate, the, uh, if you put those all together, the average tends to be pretty accurate. Um, and by doing that, you can also prompt people to think more about accuracy which, by the way, is a scalable solution. It's easy to remind people to think about accuracy. In fact, I'm doing it right now. So those are a couple of things. And as they speed round to end, what to do about social media platforms? Should there be regulation? Could there be regulation? How do you find that line between abrogation of free speech and protecting from wanton disinformation in a, just a few seconds each? Renee? 
Uh, yes, there should be regulation. Um, <laughs> um, it's like a whole other talk, right? Um, I think that what we need to be thinking about is uh, creating oversight. I think that tactics evolve so quickly. Self-regulatory mechanisms are in many ways very helpful when dealing with affordances and algorithms, but oversight is, is key. And Gordon. I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rene Duresta, Gordon Pennycook, thank you so much. We'll be looking more from you. And Gordon, if you can give us an ability to self-administer the test to figure out how susceptible each of us is in the Nudstock community, I think it'd be hugely popular unless we flunk the test, in which case we'll say it's crap. Uh, but thank you both <laughs> so much, so much for your time. I know it's precious, particularly now with all the work you're doing. Appreciate you coming on Nudgestock. Stop.